It is my great pleasure to introduce today's commencement speaker, Governor John Hickenlooper. We are honored. We are honored to have him with us today. John Hickenlooper is a former geologist and entrepreneur who recently added author to his resume with the publication of his memoir, The Opposite of Woe, colon, My Life in Beer and Politics. He champions innovation, collaboration, and efficiency. When he was inaugurated governor of Colorado in 2011, having run on his history of collaboration for community good, he became the first Denver mayor to be elected governor in 140 years. He also became the first geologist to become a governor in the history of the nation. and the first brewer since Sam Adams in 1792. Again, he has recruited talent from all quarters and is redefining the relationship between a state government and its business and civic communities. Since taking office in 2011, the governor and his team have endeavored to make Colorado the most pro-business state with the highest environmental and ethical standards. He is a great believer that governors, far more than Congress, can revive American democracy. I present to you Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that rousing introduction. And thank you also for your many years of service to this remarkable institution. I also want to recognize and thank the entire board of directors, uh, the faculty who are so generous and give, them, give themselves to all of you students. But I also want to make sure we thank the parents who have paid the toll, and I'm not just talking about the money, but paid the toll, the tariff on all of you. But last and most importantly, I want to thank all of you. Congratulations. Now, you'll get another chance to clap, don't <laughs> I am truly honored to be at Colorado's campus in the sky. It's home to our best biking team in the country. <laughs> and where else can you take in a snowdown hike and rock climb Turtle Lake, kayak the Animus, or hang out on the rim in hammocks on the same weekend. I, I chose the wrong college when I went to school. Now, I'm the last person who should ever be giving a commencement address. I'm dyslexic, a slow reader, and as a concrete example of how often merciless uh, the nature of the universe can be, like so many dyslexics, I had a mild version of attention deficit disorder. So imagine already a slow reader and then a short attention span. It's amazing I ever finished a book. It took me 10 years to get my undergraduate degree and my master's in geology. I was there so long they gave me tenure as a student. But the key to it all was I learned how to learn. And Learning new things allowed me to eventually become an entrepreneur, someone who comes up with an idea for a business and then launches it and operates it. But before I became an entrepreneur, I learned to fail. One way to look at my life is that I dropped out of college for a year, finally got back and got the degree in English, uh, tried and failed as a housing renovator, and then as a real estate developer, went back, got a degree in geology, then got laid off as a geologist. Now that's one perspective. But I didn't quit. Thomas Edison failed 900 times trying to invent the light bulb. When asked how he endured such failure, he said he never failed. He just didn't realize in the beginning 
that inventing a light bulb would require 900 prototypes. When I got laid off as a geologist, I used my severance money to open a restaurant and a brewery. We built 14 more brew pubs and restaurants across the West. The vast majority succeeded and are still around. Now, that first one took two years to get going. My own mother wouldn't invest. She kept saying, who, who in their right mind would go to a brewery for dinner? But I didn't quit. I believed, and finally it worked. I made, in, I made enough money in that first decade so that I don't have to work again. So I got convinced to run to become Denver's mayor, even though I had never run for student council, let alone class president. I started way behind, and I lagged the other candidates most of the campaign, but again, I didn't quit, and I won with two-thirds of the vote, and then when I ran for re-election four years later, I got 87% of the vote. And as Dean Thomas said, I'm the first brewer since Sam Adams to become a governor. I'm only telling you all this because my failures became strengths and added up to what we call experience. And I may have lost faith from time to time, but again, I never quit. I just reinvented myself. Now, Stephen Colbert said, if everybody followed their first dreams in life, the world would be ruled by cowboys and princesses. <laughs> All of you are likely going to reinvent yourselves multiple times. Automation and artificial intelligence, just all manner of innovation, are going to require each of you to become entrepreneurs of your own lives. Now, this might sound a little scary to some of you, but it's not. It won't be scary. You won't be doing it alone. You've already begun your lifelong education in, in working in groups. You will create your lives together with each other, and that will excite you and challenge you. I grew up as a skinny kid with a funny last name, with thick glasses and a wise-ass mouth. Chicken Cooper, Poopin' Scooper. <laughs> you bet I was bullied. But by the time I got to that decade in college, I understood how it felt to be left out or left behind, and that compassion and empathy colored how I learned to learn. With empathy comes understanding, and with understanding comes love. My mother once described the greatest gift she ever received as an act of love. My father was slowly and painfully dying of intestinal cancer. I was eight years old. He was racked by fever. He would wake up almost every night in a cold sweat, almost always a couple of times. My mother would roll him halfway over, roll up the sweat-drenched sheet, begin to put down a clean sheet, roll him back on the clean sheet and finish removing the sweaty sheet, and then finally unrolling and tucking in the clean sheet. One day, her good friend Agnes Nixon, who wrote soap operas, you guys haven't heard of soap operas, but like all my children, as the world turns, one time Agnes Nixon was sitting at my mother's kitchen counter having coffee with her. She asked my mom why she was doing so much laundry. Mom told her. The next morning, a delivery truck pulled up with a pile of clean sheets and pillowcases and new sheets arriving until my father's death 10 months later. It was my mother's greatest gift because she never asked for it. Agnes Nixon was just paying attention. Those clean sheets were a simple expression of her friend's empathy, of her friend's love. It allowed her to spend precious time with her husband and us kids. If you want to be successful, really successful, really good at working together, Pay attention to each other. Find ways to express your empathy and caring for each other in action. Give gifts freely. I mean, it's important to talk about stuff and to express emotions directly and openly. My wife says I don't do it enough. But don't let words get in the way of action. Gifts, even just listening, will deepen your friendships, and your life will be littered with love. As you become the entrepreneurs of your lives, as you create and launch your ideas, the people with whom you surround yourself, with whom you share yourself, will become your greatest resource. 
Choose your friends wisely. And when someone reveals himself to you, believe them. And be careful of anger. Anger divides. We had a trick in the restaurant business when someone was really angry, used their exact words back to them. Hearing their own words often validates what they feel and allows them to reflect on it. We said that, you know, making sure that they feel heard made all the difference. Now, embracing c compassion and empathy means that you have to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. In the restaurant business, we used to say that there's no margin in having enemies. Even the most unreasonable customer should leave knowing we care. Now, you're entering a world with hardened dividing lines, rural versus urban, black versus white, left versus right, us versus them. One of the real dividing lines, however, is class mobility. Historical inequity has created an unequal, unlevel playing field. Our original sins were slavery and unspeakable violence against Native Americans, and then generations of delays obstructing civil rights. It's a story of places like Sand Creek, where in 1864, almost 200 Cheyenne and Arapaho, mostly women and children, were br brutally slaughtered. And three years ago, I apologized on behalf of the state of Colorado that committed this atrocity. <laughs> but there is no rationalizing. These are scars we well and should always carry. In, in large part because of our past, today too many people are unable to fully realize their dreams. They could do everything right and still not achieve their potential. It's still that much harder for kids of color. And we need more compassion for our history and the attainment gaps we've created so that we can unmake them. Now this is going to require entrepreneurship of a different kind and it's going to require listening. It's got to be based in empathy and will be accomplished by working together. Empathy is not an emotion that seems to come naturally these days. Hate and judgment go viral, and our opinions of others are hardened without facts. But compassion is like a muscle. You can develop them, you can develop it with, with constant strengthening and exercise. It requires immediate recognition of prejudice and of your own limited perspective and experience and confronting those emotions, putting them aside, and trying to embrace your better angels. We all have dreams, and we all have nightmares, but we are the ones who control which we invest in. Feed your dreams, not your nightmares. And this is where your education sets you apart. You don't enter this world looking to deepen our divides. You look to widen our shared experience. Entrepreneurship isn't just about making money. It is about taking risk and transferring it into rewards. It is about providing sustainable food and water to drought-stricken Asian and African villages, or providing clean, renewable energy. It is about creating new ways that allow us to remember, but still move beyond the world's, the world's history of prejudice and hate. Indeed, there is no margin in having enemies. We live in a world where people are living longer. There's less war less hunger, less poverty, and less disease than at any time in human history. Don't face the world with cynicism and fear, but with a different perspective, full of compassion and entrepreneurship and excitement. Be confident knowing you earned a diploma that gives you this authority. Now, it's not always going to be easy, but especially when you're, when you're facing a really difficult challenge, a steep hill to climb. I always used to tell a story, and I've told it many times, of when I was first running for mayor and I was at 4% in the polls. And I carried a tattered newspaper clipping from the Denver Post about a professor of public speaking at the University of Wyoming. And she was telling her class the importance of using opposites when you speak publicly. If you talk about the worst of times, talk about the best of times. If you talk about the agony, talk about the ecstasy. The words gain power by being close together. She asked her class, what's the opposite of despair? The kid raised her hand, said joy. She goes, exactly. When you use despair, use joy in the same sentence. They create emotion by, by the proximity. 
Then she said, what's the opposite, what's the opposite of woe? And a kid way in the back says, giddy up. <laughs> and the bottom line is that the opposite of woe is to giddy up. And especially when things seem daunting and you're not certain of your success, it's a great way to make sure that you don't quit. You work a little bit harder than you were working before. We'll all be on your team. We're part of your network now. And whenever you need to giddy up, we'll be there with you. Good luck.